Welcome to Juliana Greenspan. First question is from Aisha. So you mentioned in your June 2017 interview with Mr. Ralph, Law Business Politics, The Real World Class, that your role as a defense lawyer is to never question your client. However, you wouldn't, wouldn't you find that beneficial, knowing the whole truth, as you will not be blindsided by the facts or the underlining issues when representing your client, given that other people are questioning your client and the client is, is to assume that you are in their corner? I'm glad you asked this question because it's, it's a misunderstanding and it may have been a misunderstanding that, that I'll take responsibility for in how I was answering whatever question I was answering when I said that. But what I meant when I said don't question, I meant don't question your client when they tell you things. Don't, don't be suspicious of your client. Not don't question as in don't ask questions, but don't question them, don't judge them. The judge and the jury judges them, the crown judges them, the police judge them. You are the one who is not to judge. So when I said the word question, in my brain I meant don't, don't question what the client tells you, but I didn't mean don't ask your client questions. So, so as a result, hopefully that clarifies whatever I said on that YouTube thing last year. Um, but but it, I, I cross-examine my clients. I mean, I ask them a whole lot of questions because oftentimes the only way that I can learn what the defense is or what's really going on is from my client. They know a whole lot more. Sometimes they don't always know more because I don't even understand why they're charged in the first place, but they'll offer me information. So what I meant was don't doubt your client. So question by doubt, not question by asking questions. Um, and, that, and I still stand by that. So, so if, you, if you think about the word question in that context, you watch it again, that's what I'm talking about. There are times, as defense lawyers' roles, where you don't ask your client certain questions because of a whole host of circumstances. But, and your role as a defense lawyer too, and that's part of maybe some of the other questions that will happen today is, is that, is that our, our job is not necessarily to get at the truth. Our job is to be there as a protector of a person accused of a crime who's presumed to be innocent to ensure that the government, the power of the state, does not oppress that person and is bound and held to their requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so we have a very particular role. And sometimes it is a matter of going to that individual, the client, finding out everything that you can to understand certain circumstances. But sometimes you can't question your client for a whole bunch of very fact-specific reasons as to why. But just to, so just so you know about that question, is it, it's twofold. We're not always there necessarily to get at the truth, because sometimes our clients can't even offer that to us. But that's not part of our role, which is a subset of your question. But the bigger one that I want to make absolutely clear is, is I did not mean don't ask your clients any questions. Um, but I mean, when you're the role of the defense lawyer, your job is to not doubt your client in a, in a principled way, which means, again, the whole world is against your client. Everybody's doubting him. The police have charged him or her, so how can they be wrong? The prosecutor is prosecuting them, prosecuting them, how can they be wrong? The judge will be the trier of fact and likely have doubt in their brain. The one person who is required not to have the doubt and is to be in that corner with that person is a defense lawyer. So that's what I meant by that. So hopefully that clarifies that. So in the light of the Gomeshi case a few years ago and the Me Too movement, there have been many cases of sexual assault this past year. The Trudeau government introduced Bill C-51 in June 2017 to amend the criminal code. The bill seeks to make changes and address concerns as to how complainants are treated in sexual assault cases and to expand the existing rape shield provisions and provide broader rights to victims through the criminal proceedings. Many defense lawyers have spoken out and expressed their concern regarding this bill because it will create broad disclosure obligations for anyone accused of sexual assault, which could put the accused at an obvious disadvantage. As, a, as an experienced criminal defense lawyer, what are your thoughts on this bill? And do you believe the criminal justice system in Canada is flawed when it comes to treating sexual assault cases fairly for both the complainant and the defendant? So Bill C-51 has multiple levels to it. And several of them, I mean, it's still only a bill, and hopefully it will, it will die in Parliament. Um, but 
Uh, several of the things that they're looking to codify the criminal code with already exist in common law, like in the cases. And so, and I can't remember all of them, and I tried to remind myself of the bill for coming here today, but uh, one of them, for example, is, is to codify that an unconscious person cannot consent. Um, that was established, it's, it's already in, in our law, like in common law, um, but they're looking to codify actually in the criminal code certain areas of consent in sexual assault law. So for the most part, the, the bill doesn't do a whole lot more but codify, and I think it's part of this movement of saying do more government, do more, do more, because there's this frenzy of, of what's going on in the sexual assault um, uh, sort of, what I will say, I mean flat out because I'm a defense lawyer too, but I have certain views about it, a frenzy that's happening and a mob movement that's occurring that I think is jeopardizing the fairness of the criminal justice process, but that's something separate. But as to the bill, I think part of the things that are being asked already ha already in existence, and so it's not doing a whole lot more. The one area that's different is this notion of reverse disclosure now, and so there's a suggestion that, and, and there's been there's been an evolution of development of of the criminal code and case law. In, in establishing a whole host of, of different and, and more complete protections for complainants in, um, in sexual assault matters, more so than in any other areas of criminal law. Like any, any violent offenses, I mean, sexual assault has been the area where there have been continued changes and continued changes and continued changes. And one of them has been things like areas of privacy, so that if, a, if a, an accused person, if the complainant has, has psychiatric records or therapeutic records, et cetera, you can't just get them. Um, you have to, you, they have their privacy interests, obviously, of individuals, and you have to make certain applications before the court to get a whole bunch of things. That already exists, and that's been in existence for a while. And in order to ask certain questions of complainants in sexual assault matters, you have to make an application. So issues of prior sexual contact. It is entirely irrelevant in a sexual assault case unless it can become relevant for the specific case at hand. So it was, it was already codified to get rid of what we called the twin myths, which were the area of someone who has sexual history is therefore more prone to have consented to the allegation that's at hand, a myth. Someone who has prior sexual history um, uh, is, is a less credible human being, a total myth. And so in order to get rid of those myths that, that was believed to exist, they codified certain things. So if you want to bring in prior sexual acts uh, of the complainant, they have to be relevant for the purposes of whether or not a judge can decide, did this allegation occur? So all of these things have happened. B so, B Bill C-51 is one further thing now that I think is what is, what is a really bad area uh, that, that's, that's been proposed is, is if the complainant has personal private documents and items, you can't just, we just, you know, accused can't just get hold of them. And you have to make applications to show why they're relevant. But what they're suggesting here is, is that, it, and this is sort of this, this idea of it's because of the post Gameshi notion, which is, you know, and, and in my view, Gameshi was one of so many sexual assault cases that exist in the courthouses all the time, and nothing's different. But it took on a level of, of I think, insanity that has caused these kinds of things. But now, if an accused person is in possession of documents, emails, texts, communications that they receive that they have in their possession, the suggested act is, is that the accused has to put it forth before the court and make an application before they're able to use it in a courtroom. The whole point of having these kinds of things is, which they're entitled to do, is to trust the, test the credibility of the complainant. If they put it all out there, there's no longer a test of credibility. And one of the things that happened in the Gamashi trial, which was a very poignant moment, one of many, was one of the complainants testified about a certain fact and circumstance that occurred and how she reacted to it and how she felt about it and turned it into what was suggested as an act of, of, of sexual assault and of assault. And in the hands of the defense, they had an email that entirely and completely undermined her testimony. And to not have that opportunity to do that when someone's sitting in that witness box and lying 
and not being able to cross-examine them because everyone's decided that when someone testifies of this kind of a very, very you know, hot topic issue of sexual assault, you can't try to undermine them because then you're a bad guy. It's a very dangerous place to be in when you're an accused person sitting there, supposed to be presumed to be innocent, trying to defend yourself, suggesting that the allegation didn't occur. And so what this bill is doing is it's trying to remove the opportunity for cross-examination of an accused person. And that is a right that every accused person is supposed to have. And to lose that right, I think, undermines the fairness of the whole process itself. So that area of the bill, I think, is very dangerous. All the other sections, I think, are are superfluous. I think they already exist in there. But, but this notion of reverse disclosure is to try to, what people are saying, level the playing field. The criminal justice system is not a level playing field. You have the state and you have the accused. And the accused is down here trying to defend him or herself as best as he or she can. And when someone's charged with this kind of offense, their life is already over. They're all over the news. They've likely lost their jobs. They've likely lost their friends. And now they're trying to defend themselves. And so there is no level playing field in it. And I think it's, a, it's an unfortunate snowballing effect that's happened because of, of, of what's occurred in the media over the last number, number of years. But that's, that's my view, view of, um, of C-51 and sort of the notions of play there. Uh, we read an article dealing with the R.V. El-Rawi case. Uh, in the article, the author states that Judge Lenahan failed to apply the proper legal standard for capacity consent. And even more troubling is that he confused the actus reus and mens rea for the offense of sexual assault. My question is, how is it even possible for a judge like this to confuse the actus reus and mens rea of an offense? I don't know if, if you, you all know about this case, which got a lot of press, uh, but a taxi driver uh, um, in, um, I want to say Nova Scotia, but I think it's now yep. it's New Brunswick, but I can't remember. In the East the Coast. The Maritimes, yeah. The Maritimes. Um, and, uh, and it was a sexual assault case. Uh, the gentleman was acquitted and huge furor over it. Uh, ultimately, and I don't know if, if, if the class is aware of this, it was appealed, uh, and the Court of Appeal um, of Nova, it's, it is Nova Scotia, the Court of Appeal of Nova Scotia overturned the acquittal, uh, and it's been sent back down for a new trial. So that's the, sort of the judicial process as it is right now. So there's an article that you guys were given, and, and I'll, I'll, I read it, and I don't understand what she's talking about, about this confusion of the mens rea and actus rea. So we'll just put that out there right now, because the judge was not confused between the two, nor did the Court of Appeal suggest that there was a confusion. It's a whole different kettle of fish that is what's going on. I think. Quite frankly, the, the, the law professor who, or the professor who wrote the article was suggesting something that I don't really see at all. Because, uh, just so you know too, like, we've all heard these terms mens rea and actus reus. And so the actus reus is what's called the sort of the criminal act, the act of a, of a defendant. That's what it, the Latin is, actus rea. Reyes is defendant. So it's the defendant's actions, the guilty actions, the purported guilty actions, and the mens rea is the guilty mind, is the mind of the accused. So, so what's, what I don't understand they're talking about is that, because when, we're talk, when they're talking about the operating mind and the mind at issue in this case, was the mind of the complainant, because she was intoxicated, gets into a taxi cab, and 11 minutes later, when the police show up, she is unconscious in the back seat of the taxi cab, partially undressed, and the taxi cab driver sitting in the front seat with her underwear in his hands and a whole host of circumstantial evidence all over the place. And so what the issue really was was whether or not the complainant had, a, had an operating mind of, of consent. And one of the things that has to be proven is, is that there's a lack of consent in a sexual assault area. And the Crown has to prove lack of consent. It's part of what their proof is. The defendant doesn't have to prove consent. The Crown has to prove lack of consent for that. And so, so the mens rea of the accused person in that sense is that they're being willfully blind or reckless to the the lack of consent that's going on. But when, when in the whole court and everybody that they're talking about is the mind of the complainant, not necessarily the mind of the, con the accused. So I don't really, I'm, like I would just sort of ignore your question in the sense of that, not get confused by it because I don't, the judge didn't confuse that. What he said was, is he said, I have before me no evidence during that sort of critical period of time that as far as I'm looking at the totality of the evidence that, the, that 
I can see beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a lack of consent at that time. Because there's no evidence before me as to what occurred during that period of time, how can I then decide beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not consent because I don't have it. And the Court of Appeal then focused on the no evidence, no evidence language of the trial judge and said, yeah, but you know, there's all this circumstantial evidence that we've decided you don't really look at to decide whether or not from this body of circumstantial evidence you could come to a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt, lack of consent that occurred. So forget the terms mens rea and actus rea, it's more about, you know, the, the, the understanding of consent and when somebody's able to consent or not consent. And we all know, as I said, the law is already existing, when you're unconscious you cannot consent. And at the moment of unconsciousness, if you had pre-consented, the minute you become unconscious you are lo no longer consenting. There was an interesting case as a side issue, case of JA in Supreme Court of Canada, where they, two people were engaged in consensual bondage together and she wanted to be asphyxiated and strangled. And she had consented to certain sexual acts. We're gonna go on YouTube so I'm not gonna get into as much detail as I've already gotten into. Well, I know it's interesting. And she passes out. Uh, and goes unconscious, and and the defense was is that she this was all engaged. She she want this was part of you know our role play and what we were doing. And Supreme Court of Canada said, you are consenting, you are consenting, you are consenting, you are consenting, you are no longer consenting. And even though you had said yes, I want this, and even though I'm unconscious, I'm okay. No, uh uh, you got to keep consenting all the way through. And the minute that moment stops no longer consent. And if the individual continues acting, they're guilty of a sexual assault. And so, so that was the, sort of the issue in this case, where the judge is like, but I have no evidence. I mean, he really, I mean, in fairness to the trial judge, he, he did grapple with all of the evidence before him and talked about it all. But he kept saying, I have no evidence, I have no evidence. And the Court of Appeal said, you have to consider how all of this evidence still does not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there, is, that there is sufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt a lack of consent that occurred in this case. And she was intoxicated, from what I understand, f from other evidence pretty heavily up until that moment of getting into that taxi cab. So, so that's what occurred in that case. So I don't, the article that was written, I, you know, I, don't, I don't necessarily can't speak directly to that. Um, and it was, it was more about that issue. So forget the Latin terms, they get, they get confusing. But, so that's, that's what happened in that case. And then we'll see. And I think it's going back to a retrial. So we'll see on a new judge how they grapple with the evidence going forward. One of the topics we have addressed in our readings this week is the whacking of complainants that occurs during sexual assault cases. In the article, it described whacking as the humiliating or prolonged cross-examination that seeks out to put the complainant on trial rather than the accused. Specious applications to obtain the complainant's records and the invoking and exploiting of stereotypical assumptions about women and consent, including assumptions about communication, dress, revenge, marriage, prior sexual history, therapy, lack of resistance, and delayed disclosure. During your impressive career as a criminal lawyer, do you believe that there has been adequate legal reform to eradicate this type of behavior? Why or why not? So you ask this one question at the end, but before we get to that question, let me talk about this article. Um, I have very little respect for this article, and I have very little patience for this article. Um, he talks about defense lawyers like they are this group of violent, vicious people who go into a courtroom with no ethics, no morals, um, no principles. And it is there that I don't appreciate it and I take issue with it. I do not cross-examine witnesses for the sake of humiliating them or hurting them. I have a good faith basis every time I ask a question and most of my colleagues in the profession all have good faith bases when we ask questions. Sometimes they're harsh questions, but that's because the position is, is that the individual who's testifying on the stand is lying. And we have a good faith basis to believe it. So we ask the questions based on that. But he turns it in a sexual assault trial, of which I've done a whole bunch of them, into this notion that the minute you start to ask harsh questions or you engage with a complainant, you're this terrible person because the presumption is that every person that sits in that witness box who's suggesting that they've been sexually assaulted is telling the truth and they're victims. And that is the wrong way to look at it. And definitely there are, of course. And, and the process needs to be fair to that witness and obviously fair to the accused. 
And that's what all defense lawyers whom I know and deal with and respect all do. So he creates this notion of this of this terrible behavior and there are obviously there are bad people in every profession and there are bad defense lawyers in our profession for sure of which we hope good defense lawyers have no tolerance for. But that's what he's highlighted, but he suggests that this is the way that it is, and it's not the way that it is. And if a defense lawyer becomes abusive or inappropriate, there is a person sitting up there on the bench who says, wait a minute, stop it. It's called a judge. A judge sits over it and arbitrates it and ensures that there is respect for the process by everybody. So. I have no patience or tolerance for this article and the kinds of things that are being said. So that said, um, there are a number of reforms that have existed, like I've said, the issues in the criminal code that have changed notions of ensuring privacy for complainants, specifically in sexual assault cases. So we can't just, we, and, and when it says you know, it's making specious arguments to get private records, if the argument is specious, the judge is not issuing it. So we can make all the arguments we want on fishing expeditions, we're not getting it. So. You don't get access to things that the court doesn't determine we're not entitled to. We don't ask questions that the court determines is abusive or inappropriate. And so some lawyers who may try to step over bounds is caught and stopped uh, in the courtroom. And one thing that's forgotten is, is that every accused person is, is entitled to zealous advocacy within the confines of ethics and the law, but is entitled to zealous advocacy, especially if that individual is sitting there and says, I didn't do this. This is what happened. And so, and that seems repeatedly, and that's my, I mean, that's obviously my mantra because I'm the defense lawyer over there with that guy who's been destroyed all over the news and whose life lost his job, lost his friends, and lost everything, but is entitled to that strong, zealous defense, always within the confines. So I don't whack complainants. I definitely go head to head with complainants when I believe that I have the, the good faith basis to do so. And if I don't, I don't do it to demean and I don't do it to act that way. And so I don't, I don't respect the article for those kinds of suggestions and the notions that, that, he, that he says. And I think, I think defense lawyers on the whole are a whole lot better than he suggests there. So, and I think that there are a lot of protections and, and a lot of them come from defense lawyers being appropriate um, and, and acting appropriately within, within the process. And I think the process works. So, and I, you know, I mean the changes will be what they are, but as long as everybody respects their role in the process, I think the process works um, just fine as it is. Prior to becoming a partner at Greenspan Partners LLP, you practiced law in Chicago. When comparing representing clients within Canada and the United States, what is the biggest difference in your opinion? Do you feel that one country has better regulations when it comes to criminal law? So the one main area, I mean, there's, there's two things that, that, I, that I noticed when I moved back home. I mean, I'm from here originally, but when I, and so when I moved back home after being in the U.S., and one of them was was the sort of harshness of sentencing uh, that continues and it's continuing in the United States like banana bonkers it's continuing but I mean and he's been sentenced to in 752 years I mean like it's just the, the, it's mind numbing and that's different than when where we are in Canada I mean Canada really is in the criminal justice system a kinder gentler nation um, and and it exists in that system and I think we should be proud of that uh, in the US they had these mandatory sentencing guidelines system both in in this like I practiced in Illinois but then there's a federal system as well where if you're convicted of a certain crime, boom, there's a mathematical equation, you punch in all the numbers and you get your sentence. And there was no opportunity for, for learning who the accused was before the court, all of the sort of humanitarian aspects that should be part of the criminal justice system were completely irrelevant. And it was very disheartening practicing in the US on that basis. I mean, you represent somebody, you represent that person. You don't represent an act or a crime. You represent who that person is, why that person did what they did if they're convicted, and what the circumstances are. And the U.S., I found, you really had very little opportunity to, to be able to engage the court in that process. Canada is very different. We, we you know, are very common law in that sense, and we, the courts comparatively can, can care a whole lot more about who that person is before that court. Um, and so that was a 
positive, you know, difference between the two justice systems, and I think it still continues. We've started developing mandatory minimum uh, sentences for certain crimes, and they've been, some of them have been deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of Canada. So they're trying to do the right thing to continue to try to remember that they have a human being before the court who's been judged, who's been convicted, and who's being sentenced. And the U.S. is a, is a lot more factory type of justice, where they literally throw people away lock people up, throw away the key, and do not care about rehabilitation, do not care about trying to reintegrate people into, into society. It's of no consequence to them. So that's one I find very big difference between the two. Um, as well, in, the, in Canada and the U.S., Canada, they, they try to inform a whole lot more what the case is, what the charges is. In the U.S., it is really a lot all about winning, and prosecutors are very focused on winning their cases at all costs. For the most part, I mean, most of the crowns that I've dealt with here have been fantastic, and they care about their role. And their role is not to win, but their role is to administer justice as best as they can. And if they look at a case and they think that a case really is weak or, or it's not in the public interest to proceed, I've actually had crowns who make that judgment call and say, you know what? I hear you. I see this case. I understand. I see the facts. I get it. And I've thought about all of this. And I have, I have a powerful role in this process. I'm a crown attorney. And I'm going to withdraw, withdraw this charge. Having thought about it all, I, I had maybe one or two circumstances like that happen in Chicago in the six years that I was there. Like they, it is all about you know, making those wins. When I practiced in Illinois, the state's attorney's office, part of what they did was the guys, because women didn't wear ties, every time they would win a case, they'd clip their ties of their, of their winning case and hang them from the ceilings so they could add up all of their wins. Okay? That's the mentality of some of the things that we were dealing with. You'd never, you really would never hear of such a thing in Canada. It's just not that kind of way. So it's all about winning there. Here it's all about justice. And I think that that's a really big, and I, quite frankly, that's the most important difference. And uh, it's good to be back. It's going to be home um, because of the kinds of things that happen in the U.S. And it's now, I mean, I've been home now for almost 16 years. And it's, it's just gotten worse in the U.S. with, um, with the toughness on crime. Uh, mentality, which I don't think we're, we're anywhere near. In the recent case of Larry Nassar, a victim blasted Nassar's defense attorney, Shannon Smith, for aggressively questioning young women victims and claimed that she, quote unquote, wasted all her hard work in law school by choosing to defend a sexual predator like Nassar. Similarly, defense lawyer Marie Hinden was accused of betraying women when acting as Gian Gomeshi's defense lawyer during his sexual assault case. While the Me Too movement has done wonders to support women victims, it seems as though the notion of innocent before proven guilty has gone completely astray, and as a result, many women defense lawyers have taken heat for being quote unquote on the wrong side of things. Though men, and white men in particular, have proven to be the beneficiaries of the single greatest affirmative action program in the world, which is known as the history of the world, some have voiced that the defense team in sexual harassment cases against women should only consist of male defense lawyers to avoid hypo hypocrisy and further public controversy. My question to you is how do you balance defending men accused of sexual harassment or assault while simultaneously empowering women to come forward? And what needs to change so that women defense lawyers are more respected in the Me Too movement era? So there's a number of things that, that, that um, you have and a number of thoughtful um, areas in here. So it, it got me to look at at Larry Nasser's, um, which obviously most of us you know about it, the, the, um, he was the, he was the, the guy who, um, Worked for the uh, um, was it the U.S. team? Um, US, uh, when he was gymnast. the Olympics. Yeah, when he was the Olympics. Yeah, no, I mean, University of awful, Michigan. Awful case, um, and it, and it, it was a, it was a female lawyer, but I hadn't followed like I didn't see that until actually I read your um, I read that about it. I mean, I obviously know about Marie uh, and and the, the the ridiculousness of of the attacks on on defending Gameshi. Uh, you know. I, I'll give you sort of my bottom line of it because I am a female criminal defense lawyer and I have no issues because I know what my role and responsibility is in the criminal justice system and whether I represent someone charged with sexual assault, I represent someone charged with armed robbery, I represent someone charged with uh, commercial fraud you know, or real estate fraud or I represent someone charged with murder. Um, my role doesn't change, my responsibilities don't change, my ethical obligations don't change, both as a, an officer of the court and as a lawyer to my client. So none of that bothers me. And for most criminal defense lawyer women, 
It doesn't bother them either, nor should it, because our role is what our role is, and we don't act one way or the other no matter what. Um, it's become very gender focused, like your question is, sort of this gendered issue of, you know, oh, well, you get a woman in on a sexual assault case because that makes a difference. It does not make a difference. I mean, you could have a woman who's a terrible advocate, and you could have a man who's a phenomenal advocate. What you want is a really good advocate. But this is what's happened in this in this notion of this of this crazy of this crazy mindset. But so Larry Nasser. So I was looking it up, and I found an article about about it. And like, and that's what women say. They're God. How could this woman stand by this horrifically vile man? And that. You would, that's probably something you wrote in an article, but, <laughs> but, but, I mean, that, that to me is, is, is the essence of what the problem is. Every single human being, vile or otherwise, criminal or not, until the case is finished, must have a defense lawyer there to do everything that he or she can do to help them. And if it's by pleading guilty and running a sentencing hearing, which is what this was, he pleaded guilty. He didn't run a trial, he pleaded guilty. Like, whatever it is, we do. I mean, I have clients who are charged with offenses, and then after investigation, I find out that they have certain mental health issues that were at play that had never been previously diagnosed, okay? Maybe they had committed that offense, but there is a fulsome explanation of the circumstances that got that person to that moment at that time. And if we just decide, oh my God, this guy did this, what, what are we doing with him? Then they are thrown away and they are ignored and they are gone. And so it's a defense lawyer's job to get to the bottom of whatever they can do, and if the person did it, then we represent them at the sentencing hearing. Or we find out if there are layers to this person's background that may offer explanation. And if there are none, and the person is whomever they are, then we do whatever we can and goodbye. And, and so in Larry Nasser's case, that's what she did. He pleaded guilty, and she tried to defend him. I mean, even the judge, I read, I didn't even know about this, but when the judge issues her sentencing verdict, she says to him, I just signed your death warrant. This is a judge, part of the judiciary, who has to have a level of impartiality, and she's caught up in the moment of hatred for this man. It is not her job to do that. She has a role to play in the criminal justice system, and she failed in that role. The lawyer for him did everything she could to represent him through this very, very difficult and tough case of a sentencing hearing. And I was reading this article, I'm this poor woman. Apparently, something on her website, someone posted on this, her, her name was, um, her name is, I think, Susan Smith. Um, someone po and a lot of lawyers came out to, to defend her and respond and say, we're defense lawyers, like, wh what are you doing to this poor woman? Somebody put on her website, okay, and it was like this unknown entry into the website, on this defense lawyer who did nothing but do the best she could to defend this man who pleaded guilty to a host of, ter of terrible crimes, okay? No, no one's doubting that. This is what they write. I'm going to rape your children and then rape you in front of your children and then murder your children in front of you but let you live. That's what someone wrote to the defense lawyer, who is all she's doing is doing her job because this person is entitled to a defense lawyer just like everybody else. This is what's gone on with society, which is a level of craziness that is scary. And it makes defense lawyers almost afraid, saying, why am I I'm afraid to take on that case because what's gonna happen to me? We shouldn't be in that position. And everybody should be respecting the roles that everybody takes in, in the entire justice system. So, when it comes to, you know, dealing with things as a, as a woman criminal defense lawyer, all I say to women who want to be criminal defense lawyers is you do the best you can to forget that you're a woman and you just be a defense lawyer because that's what I do. I mean, I focus on being a defense lawyer regardless of gender, regardless of the circumstances, and that's my only goal and my only role because if I get distracted by that, then I can't be the lawyer that I need to be for my client uh, in the situation that you know that I'm in, so that's part of you know part of those uh, of I don't know if that helps to sort of answer some of the questions, but you know the Me Too movement is a whole separate movement. I mean, obviously, part of the Me Too movement and the Times Up or whatever has empowered people to come forward and say the things they needed to say, and that's obviously very important and very laudable and very noteworthy. But it's when we're graying into saying that we are too soft on people charged with these criminal offenses and we need to make it easier to convict is where I say we've gone too far. And that's 
that's where it's, it's scary. And when the process works the way it works, we all have an obligation to respect that process. Even if we disagree, we have an obligation because any one of us could be charged at any moment with a criminal offense and be innocent. And then we think, oh my God, what did I do up to that point? Now I need a zealous defense and I can't have one. We always have to be mindful of that. I think it's a, a scary, slippery slope. So I don't know if, I, I don't know if, if there's any more of the, I don't, can't talk about the history of the world. Um, I don't know if there's enough time, but, but, but you're right. And there's a whole lot of issues at play, but those are societal issues as well too. And I don't think that they have a whole lot of a place in the criminal justice system. As a lawyer um, and as a woman with extensive practice in criminal law, do you believe that our justice system is sympathetic towards uh, women and biased against men? Consider how the law has criminalized aggression and historically where such law is about male standards of acceptable conduct or about male patterns of behavior. The law seems to be gendered, especially in relation to violence. The laws on sexual assault and domestic violence are examples of these. Consider domestic violence cases, for example. The evidential burden is quite limited to convict a male. It seems that once a relationship between the male and female is established, any and every claim against the male is held on the presumption that the male is a stereotypical abuser and the female is a damsel in despair or a battered woman. It is almost as if there is a reverse onus on the male to prove his innocence. Family courts too are prone to this. The female is viewed as the nurturing and caring, whereas the male is again stereotypically portrayed in a less favorable light. This even works to a point where sometimes gender stereotypes benefit women, particularly in the areas of criminal justice. Scholars have found that women receive shorter sentences for sex crimes than men. A 2014 study even suggests that federal courts are more lenient on female defendants in general. They're less likely to incarcerate women and tend to give, when, give women shorter sentences than men. Based on all these facts, do you agree that such biases exist in our justice system? Yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, you've laid it out there, and I, you know, and I, yes, I do. I mean, I, yes, biases, biases do exist, um, and um, and they will continue to exist. You know, and it's a matter of of, of um, fighting through those biases. And I do a number of domestic uh, assault matters, and I have women clients, and I have men clients, and I have circumstances where things did happen in circumstances where whomever the complainant is is doing it to gain leverage in the family law proceedings and that is not uh, uncommon um, and I have them in situations you know where there are cultural issues and cultural differences and all of these things come into play uh, in a general sense but one of the things that your question made me think of is I don't know if you're if you guys have knew about this case of um, uh, Uryar uh, decision, and it was he. The, they were they were university students. I think they were PhD students, and they were studying. Uh, I think at York University, and they were in a in a relationship, a sexual relationship, uh, and then she uh, made a complaint against him that she had been sexually assaulted by by uh, this sort of boyfriend. They were in a very sort of loose relationship. It got a lot of press coverage. She went public. I mean, also one of the other things too about com in complaints and sexual assaults is there's actually an automatic publication ban of the person's name. So there's an automatic um, determination of privacy for the complainant, and it's up to the complainant to decide whether or not he or she wants their name to go out publicly. Um, and the, the, the accused, there's nothing the accused can do about it. I mean, it's part of our of our of the of the statutes but um, so she went out publicly her name was Mandy Gray and she was the complainant in this case uh, and it got a lot of coverage it was at Old City Hall in Toronto and the judge was by the name of Marvin Zucker and it was trial at Old City Hall uh, and he he ultimately convicted the the gentleman uh, in a 179 page conviction Usually, a con like a conviction is about a page and a half or an acquittal. Uh, like he went out of control, and he cited literature like you would not even believe. It's worth just even looking at this case because it's just unbelievable, and about the history of of, of women and stereotypes and gender issues and all, all of this stuff 
like, like you've never seen before, having nothing to do with the case whatsoever. The accused testified. He makes all of these decisions about why he disbelieves this man, um, which had really no foundational basis at all. I mean, he hated him, and he was going to convict this guy at all costs, no matter what, even though uh, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, uh, if not direct evidence and supporting evidence, uh, that there had been full and complete consent. Uh, and then when she was making the suggestion she was, is that she was, shouldn't have been believed. But that being said, he convicts him and immediately pulls his bail which is a very unusual thing to do. He applies, he gets bail right away, and his conviction was overturned um, in, um, in late 2017 here in Toronto. And of course, the overturning of the conviction is not necessarily as much as the conviction itself, but it was still in the news. And it's a pretty resounding overturning of the conviction where the appeal judge said uh, what he was doing, and he made all of these comments. And one of the things he says in his, in his judgment, which brings me back sort of your question, is, is that the judge in the, in the trial itself cited to all of these examples of fact, for example, the complainant texted um, the accused earlier in the evening and says, when we're done, you'll come back over and we'll have hot sex. And the, that was offered and the judge discounted that, you know, saying, you know, so what? And that doesn't mean anything. And a number of other things that happened where she was actually aggressively touching him at the bar earlier and he said, stop it, don't stop touching me. And he testified to that and the judge ignored all of these signs and in fact she was the aggressor in that sexual encounter because he wasn't going to let that be. He was the rapist and he was the one who did that. And in, in the decision from the court, from the appeal judge, uh, Justice Dambrot, he, he, he says some things I thought I'd read and if you're interested in the case, um, and I can give you the citation afterwards, but one of the paragraphs was is he said, um, He's going through the trial judge, says, for example, beginning at this page, the paragraph 483, which is a hugely long decision, the trial judge made reference to the appellant, and the appellant is the, the gentleman who was convicted, the appellant's evidence that the complainant was the aggressor throughout the evening and early morning. Then, in paragraph 488, he said, to listen to Mr. Uyar, the accused, paint Miss Gray as the seductive party animal is nothing short of incomprehensible. He explained why it is incomprehensible in the following paragraphs, and then he says, the trial judge, despite considerable research and publications in professional and popular journals concerning rape, rape myths continue to persist. There is no demographic profile that typifies a rapist. There is a danger of stereotyping rapists. When the accused is a friend of the victim and uses that relationship to gain and then betray the complainant's trust, there may be a need to be informed in order to recognize and understand understand the accused's predatory behavior. Then, this is citing the trial judge. This is what the judge on the appeal said when he overturned the conviction. I understand the trial judge to be saying that the appellant's evidence, the accused, is not credible because it conforms to a pattern of behavior that might not be seen as predatory by the uninformed, but can be recognized as predatory by those who are informed, presumably by rape literature. If this is his reasoning, it is not permissible. It is one thing for a trier of fact to recognize that a friend of a complainant may have raped her. It is another thing to reason backwards that friendship or niceness properly understood can be a badge of rape. That appears to be what the trial judge did here. I agree with the trial judge that we must be vigilant to reject pernicious stereotypical thinking about the behavior of women. At the same time, we must not adopt pernicious assumptions about men and their tendency to rape. And that's what happened and definitely happened in this particular case and that accused person was vilified for making possible suggestions that she was all over me. I mean, she was touching me and all over me and the trial judge said, it's impossible and cited to rape literature. It's the stereotypes on both sides that must be removed from the court process and they can fortunately continue to exist as recently as, you know, in, within the last year. And it's a matter of constantly fighting and trying to ensure that no rape myths on either side come into play in the criminal justice process.
We recently read an article which addresses that many women having a career in law chose to leave the profession at a higher rate than men do uh, due to various reasons. One of the reasons that was mentioned was that women lawyers are not really satisfied with certain aspects of their work such as compensation, job opportunities, job setting, and promotion prospects. It was, it was mentioned in the report that women are overlooked by possible mentors and are left out from working on challenging files, which results them in out, outing of their law career. My question for you is that do you feel that that reason is justifiable and things like these do happen to women? And what advice would you give uh, women who aspire to become a lawyer? Um, I mean, the law profession is very big, and there's all sorts of different types of areas of law. I mean, I obviously do criminal law, which doesn't involve huge law firms and huge law firm structures. And there are complications working in law firms, in big law firms, for a whole host of reasons. And I mean, you know, I said earlier, you know, you know, I'm a defense lawyer. I'm not a woman. I'm just I'm a defense lawyer. But obviously, you know, your gender gets into your into your profession and how you work. You have children, uh, and you're the mother. You're the one who has to have the children, um, and there's no getting out of that, uh, you know, in, in that circumstance. So there are complications of being a, a woman in a professional career, but it's every kind of professional career, and it's every kind of circumstance. And so it is difficult, and so sometimes women want to take mat leaves and go take time off, and the you know, the partnership train leaves them, and then they can't come back into the fray as easily, and it's complicated. A law firm like Learners, for example, there's a lar lar large law firm, and they've been lauded for this. They've created systems to, to, to recognize and deal with that and keep jobs open for women when they take time off and they come back because they recognize that, it, let's say, a particular woman, hard worker and just as good as any man out there that's going on, they want that person to come back and they create situations. It is difficult you know, for women to try to be a mother and to try to do all sorts of, of things at the same time and try to manage. And the only thing, which is like in every profession and in every circumstance, is to have a very good um, uh, you know, base of community help. And so, I mean, uh, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I moved back was to be with family. Um, yes, I moved back to work for, for my dad, and, um, and I was grateful for that. My family was here. Uh, and it makes a big difference when you want to be in a profession that requires a ton of hours, a ton of devotion, a ton of, you know, meeting people and, and, and preparing for work and all of those kinds of things, and you want to have a family, you need, you need a community base of supporters around you uh, to be able to do that. Otherwise, it is an impossible feat uh, to manage in anything, whether it's criminal law or any other type of area, and especially if you're, a lot of criminal lawyers, women are sort of solo practitioners because we don't have these big firms. So, but it's a, it's a constant challenge and it's always existed. And, and the only thing I say is, is do the best you can to have a supportive partner um, and, and or supportive people around you, because um, then it's just, it's just not possible to do. And that typically ends up being for the man. I mean, the man has a supportive spouse, a supportive family, whatever. Same thing for women. They need, you know, a supportive network in order to be able to work. Otherwise, it's just it's not possible um, to function, whether a lawyer or, or you know, or an ex you know, anything else, anything else that you do. That's the most important um, did, did area. You, and there are challenges. Did your father do a lot of babysitting for the grandchildren? Oh, huge! It was huge. all over it. I think he changed my diaper once, and then never again. I said to my mother, but I mean, that's, but that's, that's the hugest part. You need people who who are who are there for you and who can support you. Otherwise, it's you might as well not bother. And that's why a lot of women leave the profession um, because of that, because they want a family or they want children, rightly so, and they cannot keep up because it's just it's harsh. But not because it's male focused. It's just it's a harsh whatever profession is a harsh profession to to be in. So you've been a successful uh, defense attorney and uh, have defended many clients. It is substantially hard to defend a client when all the evidence is against a potential client and every other person, other than the person's attorney, is questioning the accused's integrity. My question to you is that our system is our system capable enough to? give fair trials to the accused and is there a need for major legal and policy reforms? If the system works as it should, then it, then it, it is doing right. Um, and 
Part of what the system is, is the right to full disclosure. So when you're charged with a criminal offense, uh, you are entitled from, by the Crown. I mean, the law requires it for you to get the disclosure that the Crown has to prove their case so that the individual can look at it and put together a defense if there's one to be done. Uh, you're entitled to a defense lawyer uh, if, you, if you want one. Um, and, and you can get one. I mean, if you can't afford one, you have legal aid. And so there's a lawyer to help defend you. Uh, and then you have the right to cross-examine and the accusers uh, and the right to test and cross-examine the evidence. And so, you know, when that, when all of those things are working at their full capacity, the accused has the fairest trial that the accused can possibly have. And hopefully you have an impartial judge or impartial jury uh, and they listen to the evidence and they take their job seriously and they make the decision at the end of the day. And all we can hope is that everybody does their job properly and I think our system is a very impressive system. Um, and especially when we have the notions of the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And when everyone respects those principles, um, I, I think the system works wonderfully and beautifully. It's when we start forgetting all of those parts uh, that are supposed to work that I think the accused is no longer getting a fair trial and that's when there's a problem. And so when Crown attorneys hold back evidence, um, as had happened in some of these wrongful conviction cases, or when um, uh, there are biases of judges that they let themselves be impacted on those biases before deciding whether to acquit or, con or convict, it doesn't matter, the system is not working properly. And so everybody has to fulfill their role properly and when they do and the Crown's not looking just to convict at all costs, they're looking for fairness, they're looking for a fair justice process without any entrenched interest in the in the win, um, then I think the system works well and I think an accused person is going to have the fairest trial that they have. Uh, and I don't think that there's anything more or, or, or needed in order to ensure that it's just to continue to inform the public and inform all of the players that, that the system has to work at its full capacity. Otherwise, then we have a problem. Uh, Ms. Greenspan, serving as a criminal defense lawyer, you've, uh, uh, you're undoubtedly aware of the notion that any individual is deemed innocent until proven otherwise. My question to you is during your career in which you've represented numerous differing individuals, have you ever experienced a doubt that a client wasn't innocent? And if so, did this hinder your moral compass? By the way, your question had the word super successful career, which you didn't say, so I just wanted to, <laughs> just wanted to throw that word you forgot in there. Um, so, uh, so, so here it goes back to like the original question that, that, that happened here. My, you know, and it's complicated, it depends on the circumstances, but my, my principled role is to not doubt, okay? And so if my client says to me, um, this is what happened and this is what I did. And even if I look at it and I say, I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't see it. Um, if I then do that doubting, that questioning beyond what my client says, then, then that person no longer has anybody there who is, who is going to go to bat for that individual. And so I'm obligated not to doubt. I may have a personal doubt and so by doing that I may say, okay, wait a minute. I don't understand. This and this and this and this. And then they say, okay, well, whatever. And I can then get to the root of something else at that point. But I can't, I can't walk around saying, you know, this is what he or she has said to me. And I've asked and I've gone over it and over it. And this is what he or she has said to me, but I don't believe it. Um, and so therefore I'm in a, I'm in a problem zone. I don't have that that ethical problem and I don't have that moral problem. I will believe what that client says to me because I'm obligated to do so. If the evidence doesn't support that and there's things that are in contravention of whatever they're saying, I'll put it to the client and I'll say, okay, okay, you say that you were at this parking garage, but here's, here's this, explain that. And if they can't explain it, then we can go and they can say, okay, well, you know, I may not have, you know, told you the whole truth. And, and that, happens and it's a process that occurs you know there was a my, I think my dad wrote about it in, in, um, in his in his book from years ago an old case that always resonated with me and it was the case of and I'm forgetting his last name but his first name was Lorenzo something or other and it was a lawyer it was a a man who had an, it was a woman who had an affair with another man and the spouse ends up getting murdered okay so it was a murder case and it was a lawyer who was charged and and it was this very interesting, he ultimately was acquitted, I mean, after a very long time. 
But from what I remember from, and I think my dad wrote about this case, because it was a very important case. It goes to the heart of this issue. The client told the lawyer my father's story. And so on the basis of that, he went and he investigated and he found all this out and he proved beyond a reasonable doubt that it was a lie. And so he went back to the client and said, okay, this is, I've now just disproved your entire case. And he's like, okay, well, it was this. And then it continued and continued and it turned out that what the truth was, was still innocent, okay? But what the truth was, was a truth that he was not willing to completely share because it outed somebody else. I mean, there's a, and I'm getting the story slightly wrong, okay? But, but what ended up happening was is that this, this client just couldn't get to that truth because of a number of reasons that didn't mean that he was guilty, but it meant that he had to then say something he may not have even wanted to share with his lawyer. And so that every time the client says something to you, you shouldn't doubt it and you go and you do what you got to do and then maybe you'll get to the truth at that point. But if you doubt it, and you, then you start to undermine this client and if, if the lawyer had doubted him from the beginning, he wouldn't have gone and done the kinds of things necessary to finally get to that point to be able to defend that person properly. And that's the bottom line. And so, you know, I have no problem not doubting my client and I will do what I need to do. But if a client, and this is something that we, people tend to forget, if a client says to me, no, I did it. Oh, no, no, I, I did this. Is, here's how I did it. But I'm going to get on that stand. I'm going to testify that I didn't do it. I will never put my client on the stand. I am ethically bound not to permit perjury. So once my client tells me something and I am aware of it in that sense where I know and then he's about to go on the stand and say something else, then I have certain ethical issues that I have to deal with in that sense. Although there was, there was a very famous lawyer, I think it was Arthur Martin who, who said this, who did not have that ethical problem. And he said, my client lies to me all the time. How am I supposed to believe what my client says to me? But when my client goes into that witness box and swears under oath to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, that's when the truth is. So even though my client says this but then gets on the stand and says that, I've got no eth ethical problem because how am I supposed to know whether he wants to lie to me or lie to that guy or lie to that guy? But when he hits the box, that's when he does that. So it, it's a very different kind. People have different compasses, but I will never suborn perjury. I will never act in a way that's contrary to my ethical obligations or my criminal law obligations. I mean, if I'm told by a client he's about to go commit an offense, all these kinds of things, I'm affected by that too. So, so I'm still bound by all those things no matter what, but I will not doubt I, will, I do not have issues with that and I don't walk around thinking I, I doubt my client because then I will ultim ultimately undermine his or her defense and then I'm of no use to that person. On behalf of Ryerson, I want to thank you, Juliana. You're